Hello again, everyone, and welcome to the program. And thank you for joining us today for this week's episode in the Trent Talk series, Unmasking Racism. I'm Stephen Stone, Trent University Chancellor and proud alumnus. Today, we're joined by two faculty from the social work program here at Trent University, Professor Dalen Taylor and Dr. David Fearang. Uh, Professor Taylor, welcome back to Trent Talks. Uh, as we know, your research examines skilled migration, immigration and settlement, social identity negotiation, race and racism, health inequities and the health and well-being of marginalized communities. And Dr. Fearang, your research includes child welfare policy and practice, immigrant transnationalism, housing and homelessness, social diversity and anti-oppression, Afro-Canadian issues. Before we begin our discussion today, we would like to first respectfully acknowledge that Trent University is located on the treaty and traditional territory of the Michisaugig Anishinaabeg. We offer our gratitude to the First Peoples for their care for and teachings about our earth and our relations. May we honor those teachings. And it is important to also acknowledge that there is significant racism in Canada towards Indigenous peoples. And we'll be talking more about this in depth next week. Dalen and David, I, I want to thank you for making space and for the extra emotional labor involved in discussing and teaching about racism. This week's format will be a bit different. As an older white male, and therefore inevitably someone who has been a lifelong beneficiary of white privilege, uh, no matter how evolved I may try to be, I think it is very important for me to be actively listening today, not talking. So I'm gonna hand the show over to you, Dalen and David, and instead of me asking questions and participating, today will run as a discussion between the two of you a space for you to share your experiences and guidance. Over to you. Thank you very much, Stephen. I uh, must say, you know, this is this is a, an emotionally trying time for uh, myself, um, considering all that's going on. So thank you for that a small act of, of, you know, recognition and acknowledgement to realize that this needs to be a conversation uh, versus a leading um, you know, discussion. It's not because we have all the answers, but we too are trying to grapple with our reality of being Black in Canada and in the world. So thank you. Okay, so I just want to start by, um, you know, contextualizing, I guess, what we will be talking about throughout the, 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 uh, this discussion. Uh, David and myself, um, you know, elements of privilege, power, racism, oppression, systemic issues. Uh, how do those play in and how do those factor in uh, to where we are today? Uh, we all have seen what is believed to have started in the States. I mean, I think differently. It's just that the spotlight has been uh, a, a shine on uh, the recent incident with uh, George Floyd in the States. But this has been going on for a long time, uh, over 400 years. Uh, and what are the, 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 the causes? Like, how do we get to where we are today uh, is, I think, one of the key questions that we need to talk about uh, throughout this conversation. Um, how do we get uh, a system where police officers, for example, who are supposed to be protecting us, uh, whether, regardless of your, your skin color, uh, you know, your race, your, you know, background, uh, sexual orientation, regardless of that, how do we get to a space where police officers who are supposed to be protecting us are now openly uh, and, and without remorse, it seems, uh, you know, perpetrating some of those acts of murder, uh, literally, uh, on camera uh, and, 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 and getting away with it almost. Uh, so unpacking some of that conversation, some of those actions today and, and looking at the manifestations. Did it start there or this is just an example of how it comes to light? Uh, so I'm looking forward to having that conversation uh, I, I throughout this, um, you know, half an hour. Uh, and I'm sure David is as well. Okay, thank you very much, Stephen and uh, Friend Talks Organization Group for 
organizing this powerful but a very important episode, right? And um, following on the lead of my colleague, Dylan, I mean, I mean, the question that we all need to ask ourselves is, how did we get to where it started? And then the how and when is very, very critical. And for me, it is a privilege, at the same time, opportunity for us to be talking about a very, very sensitive, but also important question or discussions around some of these things. And I mean, it is that uniqueness of trend, that accepting the fact that something needs to be worked out we need to have a discussion that how can we all bring together our voices in a unique way to engage in the fight against anti-discrimination and anti-black racism. Now, I mean, the deaths of Floyd, George Floyd, and Regis Pachansky and others are just a manifestation of a long established anti-black racism and others around the world. For me, where and how did it get started? The idea of this of anti-black racism is an element of oppression. And oppression is manifested in the differences in our lives. When we talk about differences in our society, I mean, society has constructed people around differences. And let me share the idea that differences is not that bad. It is about how we members of society perceive differences. In a situation where members of a civilized society perceive differences as diversity, then differences becomes a blessing. But in a situation where differences is constructed along categories of the norm and the other, then differences can become a problem. A problem in the sense that, I mean, those who are considered as the norm are the dominant group of members in our society. Their viewpoints, their beliefs, their social locations actually permeate and influence every aspect of our lives. So therefore, the other, like the racialized immigrant group, people of color, indigenous people, women, have to follow through with expectations of those beliefs. For example, I mean, when I come here as an immigrant, you see there's a, a mark here, uh, I have a, a mark. That is defined and identified me as a, an Ashanti tribe. But when I was here in Canada, somebody from my tribe was trying to make that mark, right? For a three-day for a three -day born child. But he was called, the police, he was called, right? Uh, they, they called the police and the police came and arrested this person because it's, uh, it's considered as a serious child abuse. So the, the views and the beliefs and then the way of life or the dominant group is actually dictating how members in our civilized society should behave. So if you go contrary to the expectation of that norm, then you are not, you are unwanted, you, you are not regarded. So that's the othering of people then becomes a problem. But the fact of the matter that is that in Canada, we talk about multiculturalism. We stand before United Nations and brag about the fact that we have embraced multiculturalism. Therefore, we are a pretty tolerant country, a country that is measured on idea of the three cardinal social values of compassion, collective responsibility, and social equality. But these are just I mean, lip services, we just pay lip services on that. So this particular um, episode is an opportunity to help and unpack all that. And I'll come back to talk about this norm and the dominant, the privilege and the power as the discussion unfolds. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, David. And so when we talk about racism in Canada and the US, um, you know, it seems to be that uh, because it's so bad in the US, Canada is doing okay. But is that the case? 
uh, when we look at, I mean, my personal experience in my, uh, you know, recent uh, PhD studies uh, as a black woman uh, in an academic institution, some of the, the, the experience that I've had, I mean, I've been outright asked by uh, individuals who are supposed to be guiding me uh, whether or not, um, you know, their white privilege is interfering with my understanding of education um, or of, you know, certain literature. What, what does that mean? Um, you know, and, and, and it goes on and on and on. And you, you look out there, you know, black women like myself, I'm, I, I, the countless number of black individuals at, uh, in higher levels of education, the few of us who make it there uh, to begin with, our experiences are so atrocious. Uh, when you look at Canadian society, when you look at what is happening, again, if we're looking at the states and we're comparing with what happened uh, with policing and whatnot, we have our own fair share of issues uh, that have resulted, um, you know, with um, encounters of individuals who are black uh, with the police that has resulted, um, the outcome has been negative. Uh, we had in Durham recently, a young man who was beaten. And again, we continue to see these different acts manifesting and, and openly uh, being done in Canada. And yet we believe that we do not, we're not as racist as the states. When you look at what has happened to indigenous um, communities here in Canada, again, uh, the history speaks for itself. So we are in denial. We are every angle of Canadian society uh, looking at unemployment rate. Who is impacted the most? Looking at higher, um, you know, representation in certain spaces. Who, who are the people who are absent? You have black individuals and racialized individuals at the front line, but the higher up the, 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 the totem pole you go, they're absent. So for us to believe that racism in Canada is not existing or not as bad as the States, then I think, you know, we are really truly in denial. David? Thank you very much. And um, building upon uh, my colleague point, right? And again, picking from where I left off. I mean, we're talking about, this is all about the norm, the dominant group uh, with their views and beliefs uh, that this is how our society should function is the one that is the, um, what is embedded in our society and it has created and reproducing this kind of structural inequalities in our society. And so therefore, bringing it back to the policy aspect, right? All the policies that we see here in Canada are well established by this dominant white male people, that this is how our society should function. And therefore, we stand and say that we're a dominant, uh, pre, uh, an immigrant receiving society. Now, people are coming from all over the world. Our immigration policies are said that we draw people from different culture, from different background. They are coming to Canada with their beliefs, their language, their values, which is totally different from the accepted norm. So when these people have been here, and then our, our institutions, our political structures, social structures, our policies are not able to capture that dynamics around diversity, then, then we are getting ourselves into a very, very peculiar situation whereby we are telling some that you don't belong here, even though we've asked you to come, but we don't want you. That sense of belonging is not here. We often talk about social equality, that we are trying to build what is called an inclusive society, a society where everybody will build that sense of belonging, but you don't be here. And now I just want to share with you all those of you are listening, I mean, about this very important aspect of systemic racism, which can be detected in our Canadian society. And it's an expression of the practices of our social and political institution, which reflects inequalities in wealth, income, criminal justice, employment, housing, healthcare, and political power. For instance, right now, everybody will agree that black people make up only 8% of the population in Toronto. But black people in Toronto are 20 times more likely to be shot dead by the police. In Halifax, black people are six times likely to be stopped by the police. Now, black people only make up 8% of population in Toronto, 
but they account for 70% of deadly police shooting. Black children are more likely to be in foster care or enrolled in a lower academic streams level. This uh, statistics was shared by a colleague uh, in my social work department, and that black men are more likely to interact with the justice system than their white counterparts at all levels of our society. The certain is that black women are more likely than white women to be unemployed and employed despite having higher levels of education. Then black women with university degree really are unemployed, about eight, nine percent of them, compared to five percent of the white women with high school diploma. In Montreal, indigenous women are always targeted by the police. They stop 11 times compared to white women. Overall, 80% of inmates in our prisons are indigenous people. Now, let me help you all to understand that this data is shocking, but at least they also illustrate that systemic racism which occurs in our institutions that create and maintain this racial inequality. As a result of the hidden institutional bias in our policies and practices and procedures that are privileged, that privilege some group and disadvantaged group of people. So as we continue this conversation, I want us um, to be mindful of this particular situation and keep helping ourselves to understand that it is the policies, the procedures, standards, practices that are perpetuating this. And I'll come back and share more about using my and what I share with my students about what the social policy is about. We are all implementing policies which has been put down together by the privileged white supremacy class and how that policy perpetuates keeping this anti-black racism. We'll come back to that. Thank you. Dylan. Thank you, David. And just on the topic of policing, as someone who sat on the uh, uh, Police and Community Engagement Review Committee with the Toronto Police for uh, a number of years, uh, working on behalf of the community, um, and, and some people may you know, take exception when I say this, um, it's not about, I, I don't think this issue is just about policing. Uh, yes, you have police officers who are rogue officers who, um, you know, go against uh, the grain and, you know, who carry out actions that we've seen in the media. But when you look at the institution of policing, it's more than the union. It's more than, yes, union protect their members as they are paid to do. But whose interests are being represented uh, within these institutions? And I, and I think those are the bigger questions that we need to ask, because when we focus on the frontline police action alone, we're not looking at the systemic issue. For example, how is it that a police officer can be comfortable and confident enough to do what they do and not be afraid of the rep uh, reprisals from their employer? I know that as an employee of Trent, if I walk in my classroom and I do anything that's outside of uh, the norm that I'm tasked with, I know that, you know, my job is at stake. But we don't have that. So when we look at the ideology, because it's more than just police officers' action, absolutely they should be held accountable. But at the same time, let's let's not be, dis you know, let's not be misguided or misled or be distracted by focusing on just the action of a few bad apples in, a, 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 you know, police all over who are trying to do what they're tasked to do, but they're representing the, inst the, the interest of institution. So let's back up for a moment. And as I said, my experience working uh, uh, with uh, alongside members of Toronto uh, Police Services, I know that they're police officers who want to see change. But again, because they're working within these establishments, their hands are tied and there's not much they can do. Of course, they're responsible for the actions and I can't reiterate that enough. But let's look at the chain of command. When we call out these uh, individual officers, are we talking about who they're reporting to? Are we talking about who, who you know, govern these systems? No, we are not. And I think it's, it's we're, we're losing the point, we're losing this grip if we're only focusing on the front line. And the marches and all of that that's happening around the world 
from a social work perspective, wonderful. Uh, individuals are paying attention, they're engaged. And that is the, the first stage or one of the stages in, in creating change. But we need to move past that. We need to hold our uh, leaders accountable. I mean, as much as we have so much attention happening, I don't see our world leaders scrambling to get together to work out solutions and how to do this. We need to light the fire to their feet so that we can have these conversations happening and have these policies implemented and have our leaders holding these, you know, who are, who are heading these institutions uh, to make sure that they are accountable. If you are being tasked to represent, to serve and protect the public, it means everybody. It's not just the white establishment or the, the, the groups that have been um, perceived or constructed uh, to be above the law or following the law. That's not enough. It's atrocious that this is how we are as a society functioning in this day and age, and this needs to stop. So again, my question and my question to you, the audience, is when you see these things, would you, um, your child, your relative, your brother, your sister, would you settle for that treatment? And I'm pretty sure the answer is no. And then you need to take action. You need to take action. But again, policing is just one of the many institutions in society that is part of this ideology that drives a certain behavior towards certain group. Part of the institutions that we are in, David, academia, you know, this is one of the areas as well. And I'll turn this over to you and, and, and um, you know, pick up where you leave off uh, once you, you make your comment. Thank you very much, Dylan. Um, you've hit the nail right on the head. When we're talking about the police officers like social workers that I've explained to my students, are what we call street level bureaucrats, right? The, the, the idea today is about social control of activities in our society. So they move from one, one area to another every day, very tired, longing and what. But where are they getting the authority from? The authority is a reflection of the policies, the practices, the guidelines. And I always tell my students that whatever you do, you are implementing policy. But you can't just go out in the real world and start practicing social work or anything on your own. Your practice, whether you are child welfare, whether you are in the hospital or in the policing, is guided by the policies. And the policies are the guidelines, rules, standards, procedure, which are teased out for these professionals to implement. So when we're talking about all this, when I hear people talking about anti-black reason and all that, we need to go back to the root of this problem. And that is why we are here talking about institutional racism, systemic racism. Where is that coming from? It is embedded in the policies, the institutions, the structures in our society. If those structures are not critically addressed, we will never be able to move away. Like I said, these guidelines, standards, when I'm a supervisor and I work in the Ministry of say, Children and Youth Services, my job is to tease out the policy, right? I set up high standards so that I'll be always in compliance with the policy. So my servant will be like, okay, this is how abuse should be looked at. We look at the policy, the way the policy defines abuse, neglect, policing, is all that captured. And for example, like I'm using this story, when a, an immigrant has come from Africa or Ghana or from an Ashanti tribe, and there's this tribal mark, and the person get a baby and is trying to put on the same tribal mark, public health nurse may seem, deem this as a very serious physical abuse. But to this person, he's trying to practice his culture or a culture in a mainstream society. So are we saying that these immigrants that we've all invited to be part of us, where is the policies capturing their beliefs and values? How long will the policies continue to manifest and reflect only on the dominant beliefs, ideas? So those audience listen to me, I want us all to put our mind together. How do we do this? We've created a system dynamic system whereby we have the potential and ability to make it be so inclusive and be very supportive for everyone. And then building on what my colleague Dylan said, how do we even do this? And my colleagues is alerting us to the fact that we should all not sit down. And but we need to become an ally. And 
somebody the ally what does that mean as a white person right the only way you can become an ally to help change the structural systemic issues and be able to contribute to systemic racism is that you need to confront your own white privilege and in confronting your white privilege will help you to begin to learn to learn about all those any opportunity that we are talking about it is only when you begin to learn to construct understand your white privilege that you are able to challenge racism and the fact of the matter that is that if you are not actually you haven't experienced racism you don't even know what is it like you hear people talking about but it is only those who experience it can actually explain what it means people hear oh canada there's no racism i've, I've not experienced this but you you don't even know what it is so the more the starting point is taking a stand by learning and be honest and open and then accepting there's a lack of shame about my own limitation of understanding that racism really exists in canada and our understanding that this good intention do not matter even if i have good intention that you are listening to me today you are listening to day long today you are trying to understand what is happening that is a good intention but that good intention alone doesn't matter if there's no action taken against oppression and racism and to that we need to uncover our subconscious mind and attitude towards race so cbc just recently came out of a study that we need to test and tease out our racial bias that we didn't know that it is in us so we have to take a stand on that but before that we take this stand we actually have to help ourselves to understand and confront our privilege and then unpack that dylan over to you thank you david and again um you know this this it's not because we have all the answers it's not because we can sit here and tell you do a b c d but it, as you mentioned it is important for you to start questioning every, every viewer watching um you know anyone listening begin to question your own biases uh how are you listening to this conversation right now uh you know it, we're not asking you to agree we're asking you to look at the reality around you and if you're not in a position to begin to understand that then you seek out the information you seek out the education you seek out individuals who can help open your eyes and help create that awareness for you to begin to support so now what does that look like in academia for example and in any employment institution look around you if your employment uh has say you know 100 employees and you don't have fair representation not just of blacks because canada is made up of, of more than just black but has, uh, especially blacks then we have you're part of the problem your organization is part of the problem uh, what levels are individuals who are marginalized who are black what levels are they uh, uh, you know what positions are they in these institutions again if you don't have fair representations from top to bottom board of directors look around you uh, you know, in, in the hiring practices, if you are not making conscious efforts to ensure that you have representation of the quote unquote multicultural uh, Canada, which I do have a problem with that, uh, you know, because multiculturalism uh, goes, the extent of it is towards exoticizing food and food choices and, uh, you know, events and whatnot. But when it comes to individual, Canada has not demonstrated what that should look like. So then your job in listening today and wanting to help and want support, one of the key things that you can do is ensure that you are taking your superiors to task to make sure that any table you sit at, there's fair representation, making sure that your interactions with individuals of minority groups, including black, uh, black individuals, they are done respectfully, they're done from a position to learn and to understand. Keep in mind, similar to what we are experiencing with COVID, where we don't have the basis because we've never experienced anything like that in our lifetime. Many of you, especially um, in, in dominant groups and some blacks as well, the situation that we find ourselves in in today's society, we have not experienced it. To understand the history and the leg legacy of slavery that black people have been dealing with, where their economic and financial power was taken away, they were working hard. 
but somebody else was collecting on their behalf. They were not treated like individuals, but they were working like dogs and their earnings were, well, not even earnings because they were not being paid. Their labor was being appropriated. That went to building this institution that we now have without them participating at a level that's respectful, where they had the power, where they had the privilege. So that built the foundation of what you're enjoying today. So yes, you may not be able to envision what that looked like, but it, it led to your position of privilege to be able to dismiss some of the things that black people are still struggling with. We were not at the table when society, when, when this experiment of society was being constructed. Our voices were not heard. We were not allowed to vote. You know, there's so many things that we were excluded from in every single aspect of society. So it's no wonder that the system has been running full speed ahead without us. Without us. Are there some black people who have managed to infiltrate and get into the establishment? Absolutely. But it's not enough because the, the barriers, the challenges, the, the oppression, the levels of discrimination that they have to uh, encounter to get there. And even when they get there, they're still facing that. It's, it's not humane. You know, the issues of mental health impact black and marginalized communities way more. When you look at getting service, like access to service, the, it takes at least a year and a half for a member of black of the black community in Canada to receive from the time they're diagnosed to receive mental health care unlike that of their white counterparts so when you look i mean even getting into the healthcare system we have to present ourselves in a certain way you know someone going in um you know look to us to see a doctor um or you know with any aspect of the healthcare system we don't have the cultural and the, the, the level of understanding to begin, like in our systems, because there's no representation, to begin to treat, to understand, to, to talk to these individuals from a place of, of, of understanding and support. And oftentimes what you find out is that they're discriminated against. Oh, you just want drugs. You're just looking for a fix. Uh, and all those things that we have to contend with, whereas a white person can walk in these spaces and by virtue of explaining or even showing pain, their belief to uh, be feeling pain, whereas black individuals are believed on an average, and I'm not saying this is for every single black person in the system, I'm saying the majority of, and that leads to a, a systemic problem that needs to be addressed. So when you look at representation in all these levels of decision making, we need to be at those tables. We need to be a part of the conversation that's happening. I recently um, you know, I, I, those of you who have seen um, the first black valedictorian uh, uh, who uh, was a part of the uh, medical school program at University of Toronto, um, I sat on the admissions and interview committee around the time that young lady would have been uh, uh, starting in that cohort. No, I didn't interview her, but I sat on that committee uh, as well. And some of the steps that were taken was to ensure that black stu students who were applying to the program, that their experiences were interpreted. You had individuals on these hiring committees who could understand their experiences. Many black families did not have the money to send their students overseas to get those you know, prestigious experiences and, and, and go to uh, prestigious in institutions to be able to compete in, in, in hiring. Does it mean that they don't have the experience? Does it mean that they, they haven't developed this elsewhere? No, it didn't. But if you don't have people sitting at these tables who are able to understand how to apply this and how to uh, you know look for uh, how do their experience fit into the admissions criteria, then they would have been left out. The, the problem with that is that this institution is over 200, this program is over 200 years old. Is almost two, sorry, almost two hundred years old, and in almost two hundred years, we're having the first um, Black Valley Victorian. What's wrong with that? And when you look at other institutions right around academic and other uh, other places, right all, all around Canada and elsewhere in the world, this seems to be our story and the narrative. And for 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 those who are skeptic, who think that you know, you know, Black people are just making noise, I, I'd say to you, stop, just stop for a moment and look at the history, look at where we are today, look at how, at how individuals are being treated. Would you like, black individuals are being treated, would you like to be treated that way? Would you be okay with that, with that kind of treatment? And is it simply that, oh, they're bringing it on themselves? Because it's way more than that. 
And I would encourage you to dig deeper and look at the system that we are functioning within, the, the, the power, the privilege um, that is driving society. Society is meant to function for all of us. We're all human beings. Our quality of life matters. It's a journey that we are on going through life. It matters that some people are getting a better quality uh, in, in terms of that journey, while others are being deliberately pushed out. It's not, it's not right, and we should be outraged. We should be demanding action. We should be holding our leaders accountable. And as individuals, we too should be making um, decisions and choices to ensure that we are inclusive, not exclusive. I've had conversations with Trent, and, and, and Trent has been open, uh, you know, to having some of these conversations, but we also need to move that into action. Look at your hiring practices. Make sure that there's fair representation right across the board in your student admission, in your faculty, in your every, in your admin, in every aspect of the institution. It's not enough in this day and age to turn a blind eye when you recognize and, and, and see that these, these groups are missing. So you need to make con conscious efforts to ensure that this is happening. And then just to move on and be mindful of time, David, just to move on, uh, you touched on allyship and we had um, some questions uh, around uh, allyship. You know, what can whites or indigenous groups or individuals do to support, uh, you know, you know, the, 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 the message that we're trying to, to push forward, one of uh, equality, equity, uh, social justice. Uh, again, we've touched on that some uh, somewhat to say, you know, your support matters. We need to have voices. We need allies in every single sphere. So look around you. Take your employers to task. Uh, you know, how you treat black individuals. They are more than their skin color. Uh, recognizing uh, in organizations, we too can lead. Create that space and that opportunity for us to be represented. Uh, it's not enough to turn a blind eye. In, 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 in this day and age. And so David, I'll let you just comment on the, I'll ask you to just comment on the allyship and then we'll move on to what does real change look like? Thank you very much. Um, and thank you for leading everything together and really, really talking about important aspect of you know, all this. And coming back, I'm gonna repeat this allyship. I touched a bit on it, but I just want us to remind you that to becoming an ally means a whole lot of things. That allies are learners. They are those who are willing to use any opportunity to learn more about themselves and act the way that they want to learn from. So, and the, the ally is a member, can be a member of a dominant group who rejects the dominant ideology, takes action against oppression. I don't really believe that eliminating oppression Actually, all the audience listening to me, eliminating oppression benefits everyone, including me and you. And their honesty, openness, and lack of shame about their own limitation is very, very good. But Dylan made a very, very important point that I want to capture on this. How do we build an inclusive society? A society that we all feel belonging. And here, I hear in my institution, place where I've worked, Everybody is kneeling towards the concept of equal opportunity. But I would say we have to move beyond past equal opportunity to create equal conditions. And let anybody listen to me, I want to make it clear that there's a difference between equal opportunity and equal condition. Actually, let me take a measure of equal opportunities that, for example, as a professor, uh, I have to create equal opportunity for my students to learn in the classroom. Therefore, if you turn in your assignment late, then if I give you preferential treatment, it means then I'm not giving, I have to be fair to all other students. Not forgetting about the fact that your situation, your unique situation that I have to look at. So many of the time we look at equal opportunity, we say that is, we, there's no preferences, there's no bias, and therefore that's what we do. But like, the equal opportunity truly means that People are not given equal conditions based on their own situations and their own conditions. So creating equal conditions means establishing an equity practices where people are looked at, are considered. for example, in nursing admissions, 
we use equal condition to create a system whereby we look at individuals based on their unique situation. In that way, we can get racialized immigrants, indigenous uh, students into our midst. So this is very, very important thing that I would like to share. And for our university, a very important dynamic is actually we need to establish ethnic and race relationship. And I wish every university established that office. That will help students, staff uh, to learn more and to recognize and understand that racism actually exists in all spheres of our society. And I, following Ontario's government racial directive, Frank can also, uh, and all the universities around my institution everywhere, can develop and implement anti-black racism capacity, competency building, programming for faculty, staff, students, and then looking at implementing evidence-based approaches to reduce race-based disparities by collecting and analyzing race-based data. And I think we'll be able to do that by establishing broader partnership with child welfare organizations and institutions, the justice sectors, and the police to identify all these racial bias that we're talking about. So in a nutshell, allyship is all encompassing. Being able to take a stand. If we are white supremacy, take a stand. Even from other oppressed groups, we can all collectively work together to take a stand. Thank you. Over to Dela. Thank you, David. And and uh, just to, to wind down, um, we'll just spend the next few minute, minutes touching on um, a summary of the questions. I believe we've answered them throughout that we got from the public, but just to make sure um, that we've uh, hit um, you know, we're responding to some of the questions that were sent. Again, not because we are the experts, but we do have our ideas and thoughts. And it, one of the things I didn't say earlier is that Black community, there's diversity within Black communities too. Where our, our experiences overlap is how we're treated as a collective, as individuals. We seem to be at that same juncture where we are, we are oppressed, but we do come from different communities. Uh, we too have differences, which is not a bad thing. Uh, and so uh, one of the questions asked uh, for, um, you know, how do uh, white ally navigate and respond to uh, officials who use political forums or political jargon that are empty, uh, uh, that, that get nowhere? And again, it's not just white audience, black audiences also need to educate themselves, need to understand the continuum of change and policy and policy implementation uh, to ensure that these promises that are made by our leaders, they're not empty promises make sure that they're accountable, make sure how we vote, how we follow up, how we uh, you know, approach your offices, how we send letters, make sure that we're on them when these um, promises are, are made. We also uh, want to uh, make sure that community, um, different communities are involved again in pushing these agenda forward. Um, you know, one another question talked about um, whether or not some of the what are some of the feedback that we've gotten from our Caucasian colleagues or friend, and I'll say this tongue in cheek. One of my very good friends who happened to be white, uh, we you know some often hear that the other way. Uh, she was outraged when she spoke to me the other day because her colleagues, her peers, have been saying to her, "Well, does it mean now that the pendulum need to swing?" Uh, far right for for black people to 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 feel um, that they're included, and my my I, I would encourage people who are thinking that's not the, the 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 question that should be asked right now. The side to side pendulum it's 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 based in oppression discrimination. We need a circular pendulum if anything is going to work, and if it means that. Yes, it, you know, we are we have a lot of grounds to make up as black people. We've been left off the agenda since, you know, over 400 years. So we have a lot of ground to make up with, um, you know, integration in, 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 in communities and we can't do it ourselves. So there needs to be some space created for that to happen, some support created for, for that to happen. We're not asking to overthrow or to take over or for now white individuals or members of dominant groups to be oppressed. That does not serve our purpose. We are saying that society as we know it should be structured so that we all have access. 
we all can enjoy uh, the quality of life that is deserving of us as human beings, black, white, pink, orange, whatever color you may be. That's what we're saying. And so before I turn it over to, uh, to you, uh, David, then um, you know, to just close out and then hand it back over to, to, to Stephen, there's this conversation going around about defunding police uh, you know, uh, services. And um, my take on that, is it about defunding the police or holding police officers accountable? Is it about looking at what are police being called into communities to respond to? And are they equipped to respond to it? We know that they are being called to deal with many mental health issues. Well, is that a police issue? So absolutely looking at redistributing or re, um, you know, um, parceling or proportioning the funding that goes out so that the issues are being addressed. What's the point of having a strong police institution when it cannot respond to the needs of the community? We, history has shown we're, we, we've evolved, we've changed over time as a society. Why should we stop now? So to focus on whether, it, you know, labeling, defunding these, these terms that just get people all up in a knot, I think we're taking the wrong approach and we need to look at that in a more inclusive way. So if it requires reproportioning or redistribution of, of funding, uh, if it means that we're at a stage where policing, we don't need so many, we need to look at how that works, then absolutely that is what we should be doing talking about that openly and honestly and in a manner that's inclusive. I'll turn it over to you, David. Thank you very much. In summary and in conclusion, I mean, all my audience, all the audience listening to us, it's been very credible, incredible for you to come and listen to us. Now I'm building on my last point, and my colleague is talking about building an inclusive society. We cannot build inclusive society when we don't respect people irrespective of their age, gender, ethnicity, race, culture. That is the message that we want you to take home with, respecting people based on their age, gender, race, and all other social markets. But in conclusion, let me ask you, who do you admire as an ally? Somebody that you admire that has been fighting for social justice and racism. I want to share my story. For me, I admire one great, I mean, white, privileged person who actually stood up, observed, and then reflect on his whiteness and said that, look, respecting all people also means that we need to do all the good we can to all the people we can in all the places we can in all the ways we can by all the means we can so long as we can if we admire this an ally john wesley then you and i will believe that we live we need to live in a world of inclusiveness a world of peacefulness otherwise we'll be still living in the dark ages Thank you for the opportunity to speak to you on this very important but sensitive topic. Thank you. I echo you. So over to you, Stephen. Thank you again. Well, uh, thank you both of you um, for your well important and, and very powerful insights today. Um, I'm just reflecting. Um, and for those of you at home, uh, thank you for joining us. And we hope you'll tune in again next week for Unmasking Racism Part 2, uh, when we'll speak with Dr. Don Lavelle Harvard, Director of the First People's House of Learning, and Dr. Janet Miron, Director of the Frost Center for Canadian Studies and Indigenous Studies. In the meantime, we do want to hear your thoughts about today's conversation, uh, as well as your questions for next week's episode. And you can continue the learning uh, and the unlearning and the discussion on social using the hashtag Trent Talks. Until next week, stay safe and please always remember you are not alone. Goodbye for now. <laughs>